So, you're after your first new car, or maybe you've had loads of cars already and you're just after something that's cost effective and it's not, well, a bit crap. Well, we've picked three of them for you. Every one of them brilliant, but each with its own unique personality, style, and approach. One of them is a budget choice, but as you'll see, it doesn't feel that way at all. One will give you a canny bit of sportiness, but without sports car costs. And one is a surprisingly affordable and spacious electric car. So, as I stand here, any one of these can be yours on a lease from us for under £200 a month. And one of them, way under that. Not bad, eh? There just isn't an easier or more cost-effective way of getting into a new car than leasing with Vanarama. Click the link at the top of the screen or Google Vanarama to find your new lease of life. Maybe watch the video first though. And please hit subscribe to make sure you never miss the best car content on the internet. We're doing great. So let's get cracking. We'll do this thing first, Renault Zoe very possibly the best value electric car on the market. Partly because it's actually proper old, really, one of the first breed of modern electric cars. Came out all the way back in 2012. For reference, you could still get a new Proton Satria Neo then. But while the Nissan Leaf is now in its second generation, this thing soldiers on. Don't worry though, because like Simon Cowell's face, this thing's been revised and updated to the point where, although it looks familiar, it's actually very different. Although, unlike the UK's favorite pop mogul, <laughs> this has now got an impressive range. Yeah, so when this car started life, it had a mere 22 kilowatt hour battery, but now it's packing 55. 52 of those kilowatt hours dedicated to just driving the wheels. And that means it has 200 mile range potential. And if you don't believe us, you think I'm a big fat liar or something, then know this fact. In June 2021, a team from Mission Motorsport drove one of these around Thruxton Race Circuit really slowly for 475 miles on a single charge. And that's a record for a production EV. That is an unbelievable 9.14 miles per kilowatt hour. Now, in the words of my favorite consumer journalist, you will never get this, you will never get this, la 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 la. But it does show that this EV, even at this price, is a real antidote to range anxiety. Now it is worth saying that the base model Zoe doesn't get rapid charging as standard, but the rest of them do, including our sub 200 pound a month iconic spec car. So equipped, you can get this charged comfortably overnight using your wall box, or you could squirt 80% into it in about an hour. In other words, it doesn't feel any more difficult to live with than a real cutting edge EV, basically, a much newer one. To be honest, it doesn't feel like an anachronism in the cabin either. It feels two generations ahead of the 2012 car. So no matter which spec you get and which size screen you've got, the infotainment is decent, and it includes some really useful stuff, one of which is a map that will tell you in real time where your nearest charging stations are, so you can always keep on top of that. And of course, it has that lovely sense of responsiveness that most EVs have. As in, you put your foot down, it goes. There are two versions of this, one more powerful than the other, but they both have very similar torque figures, so you don't feel that much difference in terms of the low end pickle. Neither of them are exactly fun to drive though. It's mainly because there's quite a lot of body movement, right? So when you're turning a corner, it feels planted less in the sense that road testers tend to use that, and more in the sense of a tall sunflower swaying in the wind. So what that means is that ride quality is fundamentally soft, and that means that it is basically comfortable. But at the same time, there is always this underlying sense of firmness. You really feel that there is weight pressing down into this car. There's a bit of rumble beneath the tires most of the time. Thing is though, when you're just using this, as you probably will be, as a runabout to get from metaphorical door A to metaphorical door B, it feels generally emollient, it's fine. And that's mainly because, as with all electric cars, there is of course no internal combustion noise, so you don't have that whining all the time. And because it has a single speed transmission, you don't get that feeling of a break in velocity as the car is changing gear. And that does make a real difference in terms of day-to-day -day refinement, you just get that press and go feeling, there's no back and forth movement in the car. The driver's seat can't be adjusted for height, which is a bit annoying, and you do feel like you're perched on top of the car, or rather, literally on top of a battery in this case. So the driving position does just about get away with it. I'm tall and I'm fine in here, I've got plenty of headroom. But what it does do is because you're sat so high in the cabin, 
the rear view mirror becomes a bit of a blind spot because it's set right in your eye line. So you do find that sometimes you're sort of ducking underneath it to see things. That said, this driving position does have a hint of the SUV about it, which is rare and enjoyable in a car this size and shape. That feeling of looking down on the road and the good front visibility that comes with it. It's not an SUV, obviously, but you'll probably notice it's tall, which means it's got a fairly sizable boot by volume. Now, there's a couple of little things to notice. The drop down to the floor is quite substantial and there's a lip at the back end of the boot so the rear seats don't fold perfectly flush but it's canny so as you can see the rear space is okay for legs these seats are a bit thick so they eat in the legroom of it and the headroom is a bit tight despite how tall the car is because you do feel like you're sat high up on top of a battery basically but what if you feel that the time's not quite right for you to go electric that's cool you've still got Plenty of years left before petrol and diesel are big fat banned. <laughs> and actually, if you just want something that's, well, a bit more exciting to drive and to look at, then in the words of the world's greatest pop group. Nope, not that one. Whoa, we're going to Ibiza. Yep, good old Seat Ibiza. FR in this case, which stands for Formula racing. Obviously there's about as much racing technology in here as there is in the school sports day. <laughs> oh! Not really, but what this actually is, is a small and reasonably priced hatchback, but with a bit of sportiness both on top of it, in terms of the styling that is, and within it, in terms of the way it drives. See, you'll probably know that the Ibiza here shares its bits with other small Volkswagen Group hatchbacks, namely the VW Polo, the Skoda Fabia, and the Audi A1. But this is the car that the group pitches at younger drivers. Drivers who want the value of a Skoda, but with a bit more vivacity. And that's really exactly what this does. And you could make a strong case that this is the best of them, because it looks super sharp. It has design almost on par with the A1, although of course that's subjective, but it has quality pretty much on par with the Polo and value on par with the Fabia. And yet it's more interesting than all of them in my view, and better to drive. It just has that little bit of extra sharpness that the others don't seem to have. It's really the sort of car that you can lean on, as in it's got loads of front end grip, you can really feel what the front wheels are doing beneath you though, and the turn in, there's a real quickness to it. When it does start to lose grip, it's got a predictable chassis, so that's not the sort of thing that you worry about. You're not gonna lift off the throttle, get the car spinning the other way around, unless you're going really mad or you've got the skills. And the driving position is exquisite for a little car, for any car. And since the recent facelift, it really feels better than ever. So the dash top is all soft touch now, if that sort of thing matters to you. And it has the best air vents this side of the Dyson development lab. They're all backlit and the color of the backlighting is determined by the trim level that you have. So it's yellowy for SE cars, it's red for FR, and then for the prestigious stuff called excellence, it's burgundy, obviously in homage to this prestigious gentleman. I'm Ron Burgundy. The Ibiza also has bigger touch screens across the range now too. Although intuitiveness hasn't taken an equivalent uplift. Bit difficult to get a grips with this screen, although maybe that's because I'm like 15 years over the target demographic of this car. <laughs> My son would probably be instantly brilliant at operating this stuff in the same way that he is doing a 360 no scope on a noob in CAD. Sorry, what? Okay, uh, that's COD. COD. So your base model Ibiza has all of this stuff, bruh. As you can see, it's really well specified at the base, and that's your £170 a month car there. Soft leather for the steering wheel and the handbrake, smartphone mirroring, it's a techie thing. But if you go for an FR version, it really does bump up the experience for only a few quid more a month. Feels like a whole lot of small car in here. Dual zone climate control, big touch screen, sports seats, and even voice control. Quite funny as well. So to get it working, you have to say Missy Elliott's favorite greeting. Holla, holla. Holla, holla. How can I help? There you go. <laughs> and you can't. Bye then. Anyways, this car feels like it was made for FR trim because you get that bit of extra firmness, sports suspension that is, and it gives you a bit more feel, but without ever actually making the car uncomfortable, it still rides really well. Same sort of thing with the engine. This car doesn't have the most powerful of the TSIs available. In fact, it's a lot like one of my essays at university. 
not much on paper, but it sounds great. Listen, it revs dead smoothly and it's really economical, so it feels like a sweet spot. This gearbox is also one of the sweetest shifting in any small car, it's lovely. Kind of like an Aerobee, it's light and satisfying to throw. Trust me, girls love this. So you combine all that with fundamentally sound VWG ergonomics, and you've just got one of the best, most delightful small cars on the market. Can he practical too? Now, it's true that not as much thought has gone into the boot as has gone into the rest of the car. It's basically just a big hole, but it is quite sizable. So assuming you're not gonna use this to do your side job as an Amazon Prime delivery driver, then you should be okay with it. Decent amount of rear space too, quite a lot of leg room as you can see, good amount of headroom, bit more than the Zoe in here, all good. But what if space really isn't that big a priority for you, but cost is, and yet you want something that has a bit of the feel of the Ibiza? Well, you want a city car, specifically this city car, Hyundai i10. It's Prata Mint, man. It really is. This then is the latest Hyundai i10, the third version of a car that started out okay in 2007, then got a heck of a lot better in 2013, but is now probably the best petrol powered runabout on the market, including this thing. So we're gonna cheat here a little bit. You see the headline car, that's the one that's about 160 quid a month, is a base model and it's a lovely thing. It's one of the best value cars on the market actually in terms of kit and smiles per pound. It has a 67 horsepower engine that will give you about 50 miles per gallon in real life. An SE car like this does give you the basics, but to be honest, it is just that. It's safety feature rich, as you can see, but it has steel wheels and it doesn't even have rear speakers. Your best bet is to move up to SE Connect spec where the rear passengers can hear the radio and you get alloys and a touchscreen and it just feels like more car. But this isn't an SE Connect, it's an N line. N as in the letter that Hyundai gives to its driver focused stuff. Apocryphally, it stands for Nürburgring, but actually it's just the first letter of Namyang where the cars are developed. Anyway, most notably it's given to the i30N, which was proper surprising when it came out on account of how proper brilliant it is. It's mad in a good way. Now, city cars tend not to roll out of the factory all mad, right? They're normally sensible, but this car does get something that's a bit mad. It gets a turbo, yeah. Compared to the base car, not only does that take power up by 50%, but it also takes torque up by more than 80%. And all the torque comes much lower down in the rev range. And that makes a massive difference. That is a transformative thing in terms of the driving experience. It's much more flexible. It's much more eager to pull away. And it sounds great. Like the Ibiza, it makes loud. And also like the Ibiza, it's a car that you can just take total liberties with. You can fling it around and it really feels like the wheels are telling you everything. It's just like most of the layers between you and the wheels are stripped away. Even the steering feels like that. Now, no steering racks feel unassisted these days, well, because none of them are. But in a way, this is as close as you're going to get and that's a really preternatural thing these days, even if you compare it to some proper sports cars. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying though, this is not a sports car experience by any means. It's it's just that it feels basic in a way that makes it a massive amount of fun. And that applies to all the versions. So the N-Line one here isn't on fancy suspension or anything, it's just got bigger wheels. There's no driving modes or anything like that. It's just that the fun of this car is accentuated because of the additional power that you get in this version. It gives you that bit more control over the chassis. Yeah, engine aside, the N-Line stuff is mainly visual. It gets the biggest alloy wheels on any i10 and it has a two-tone roof and a bit of body kit. And most obviously, it has these triple blade daytime running lights, which are different to the ones on the base cars. But on the more prosaic stuff, it's just generally a very well engineered and very well thought out thing. Now there's some cost cutting as you would expect, like how you can't adjust the wheel for reach. And that might be a bit of a problem if you're on the taller side, but I'm on the taller side and I'm not having a problem with it. I'm perfectly comfortable in here. And then there's one or two little car traits, like the bite on the clutch is a bit high. Sometimes you'll find yourself kangarooing a little bit. Throttle sometimes feels a bit oversensitive, but it's something you'll get used to quickly. It's not a bad thing. Other than that, it's dead good. The touchscreen's dead easy to use, for example, even for this old fella. It's got shortcut buttons on it. And because you are perched up and there's lots of glass here, visibility 
is brilliant. It's so easy to place and to park this car. And the low speed refinement is much better than it needs to be. Obviously, it's a little bit more uncouth on the motorway, but you expect that, right? You probably didn't expect it to be quite this practical, though. The boot is bigger than the one you get in a VW Up, and real people with human legs can actually fit in the back, too. It has five seats. It's also five star safe. Thanks, Euro NCAP. And at the front, it's got big pockets in that. But the best thing about this is that it's still well cheap to run. Low insurance group, economical, just a lot of car for relatively not a lot of money. So there you have it. Sporty car, electric car, value car. Now, because this isn't a triple test as such, they're different types of cars, aren't they? There's no winner, really. But if it was my 200 quid and I had to pick one, I feel like I should say this one because it's the electric one and you know, the future and all that stuff. But actually, it's my fake money, so I'm gonna go this one, say it Ibiza. Now, I love the other two, I think I've made that pretty clear. The Renault is the first EV that I tend to recommend to people when they ask me for something that's gonna be reasonably priced and have a decent battery, which that does. And the i10, it's just really cool, it's dead good to drive, it's a great little city car. But this thing, especially after the facelift, it's just a lovely car. It's great to drive. It's really good to be in. I love it. And we'll end it there. Thanks for watching. Please let us know in the comments if you think there's any other car that you think fits the bill or if there's any other sort of video that you would like to see that you would like us to do. There are already full reviews of the Ibiza and the Zoe on the channel, so you can check those out. And if you haven't already subscribed, please do so and like the video if you liked it. Thanks a lot. I'll see you soon. We're doing great. Bye.